So last week, when we were talking about the, uh, some of the things that are going on in the world in preparation for the coming of the man of sin, we talked about something that we call the apostasy. And as we said, the apostasy is the, uh, the falling away or the moving away of, from biblical Christianity by people, by churches, by denominations, and that that is a strong force in the world. Now, since, since past Sunday, I came across uh, an article that was written by uh, a, a famous evangelical pastor who, who actually is retired, not actually pastoring anymore, and he said that he went to visit a mainline denomination church just to see what was happening there in, those, in these days. Now, if you don't know, a mainline church is, is uh, one of the older Protestant churches groups that would be in the United States are not necessarily older, but before the 20th century, they were the more prominent ones, uh, and so that's the main reason they're called mainline. Sometimes they're called old line, and uh, they're common both in Europe and the United States. And some examples would be United Methodist, uh, Presbyterian USA, United Church of Christ, which is not the same thing as the Church of Christ uh, here in town. Uh, Sometimes uh, Lutherans, uh, sometimes, well, Episcopals would call that always. And, and so they, before the 20th century, these groups were the more prominent Protestant denominations. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes in, in a mainline denomination, you have a hierarchy over uh, the church itself. You know, like you say, you have a bishop uh, who is supervising pastors and churches. And in some cases, they even decide where a pastor is going to be, and if you need a pastor at your church, they decide who it's going to be and, uh, and send there. But that, that's not always the case. Uh, but if you keep up with this kind of thing, you probably are aware that, generally speaking, the, the mainline denominations, the, some of the things that we talk about, they show up there a little bit more often. So this evangelical pastor went to undercover, if you want to put it that way, to... Uh, to a, a, a mainline church. He did not say which dom denomination it was. But he uh, wrote about some of the things that went on in that service. Okay, so uh, the first thing that he wrote was that they sang a hymn that was called Source and Sovereign, Rock and Cloud. And uh, in, the, in that hymn, the lyrics of the chorus says, May the church at prayer recall that no single holy name, but the truth behind them all is the God whom we proclaim. Now, do you see anything wrong with that? Yeah, no single holy name. So in other words, uh, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, they're all the same. Now, I see, I see something quite wrong with that. What does, what does Acts tell us about names? There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Uh, there was a children's message, and in the children's message, the lady that was, uh, was sharing that said, Sometimes our hopes are frustrated, and they don't come true. And sometimes God's hopes are frustrated, and they don't come true. But you children can put the pieces of God's heart back together. And then a summary statement, by sharing with each other and being good. <laughs> See anything wrong with that? Yeah. yeah the, whole, the whole thing. As, as, if, uh, as if we could uh, heal God's broken heart. As if, as if, uh, uh, as if God is frustrated <laughs> because of his purposes. And then, uh, during the pastoral prayer... Uh, the, one of the lines at the beginning said, We bless you, O God, for the beautiful diversity of the gender spectrum. Now, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't a sermon in this service. Uh, rather, there was a, what, what was called a conversation of hope between the pastor of the church and a, and a Muslim imam. And they both took the stage and they both had a conversation about, you know, things that are in common and and there was no mention of the Bible or the Quran, for that matter. No mention of, of Jesus or anything of the sort. And definitely no mention of anything having to do with forgiveness of sins and salvation. So, 
Now, this kind of thing happens in services thousands of places across this nation today. Uh, there, every Sunday, there will be things like this that happen. And so when we begin to think of, in terms of the apostasy, I would have to say, in regard to this, I rest my case. The apostasy is most definitely going on. Now, I don't mean to indicate that all the churches in those denominations that I mentioned all ago are like this. And I certainly don't mean to indicate that, that 50, 60 years ago, that even the majority of them were this way. Some of you might be thinking, you know, I grew up in one of those churches and I never saw anything like that go on. Well, that's kind of my point. They weren't going on 50 or 60 years ago, but they are now. Things are changing. And so that, that's the apostasy. Now, that, all that that I shared, I really should have been part of last week's message, but since I hadn't come across that yet, then I decided to go ahead and say it. Today's kind of like a postscript to last Sunday's message. Today, uh, we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, and the theme or the thought we're going to try to carry through today is, is that the return of Jesus is our, our hope. It's one of our greatest hopes. I would say it's our greatest hope, but our greatest hope obviously would be salvation in his name. But all that's kind of wrapped up together, you know. You can't really separate his return for his people from salvation or vice versa. And so, so that is going to be a strong hope. I'm going to read some verses. I'm going to try to lift some statements out of it. And uh, we will, I think, be blessed by what Paul has to say. So I'm going to begin with verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 1. It says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed." For our testimony to you was believed. All right, now, as always is the case with the Apostle Paul, there's no way that we could cover everything that he talked about in here this morning, so I'm going to try to lift out six different statements, just phrases that he used, and talk about how that these things progressively are going to lead us to our hope. Don't worry, six points is not going to be uh, any longer than my normal three or four. Uh, we'll be able to go through a couple of them fairly quickly, but um, th this is going to kind of move from general uh, principles about perseverance and faith moving towards the specific aspect of how that relates to the coming of the Lord Jesus. And there's a couple of things in here that I think are pretty significant as far as how we see the world, how we see God, how we see the interaction between the two, because there are a lot of people today who make accusations against God, and nobody ever has the right to make an accusation against God, but they do so. And so sometimes in the Bible, the answer that we see to people making an accusation against God is just, hey, God's God, he can do whatever he wants. But sometimes also, his choices are, are defended as being the right ones. And so 
I don't really feel any need to make a defense of God before anyone. But sometimes it's helpful if we can do so in order to remove some of the barriers that people have as they try to relate to the gospel. So the first of these six is <clears throat> your faith is greatly enlarged. He was, he was saying that he'd give thanks to God because of that. Your faith is greatly enlarged there in verse 3. Now, I talk a lot about faith. And I say a lot of times that faith is, is our responsibility. You know, you are accountable to God for your own faith. You're responsible to God for your faith. To trust Him and to obey Him, and you cannot possibly obey Him without trusting Him. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would say that every act of disobedience on the part of a Christian is due in some way or another to a lack of trust. But we're responsible to make those decisions. But in another sense there is a way that our faith can become enlarged in a way that we could never, ever orchestrate on our own. There are seasons that God takes us through in which we often don't understand what's going on, in which we, we do not see His hand, and, and we try to look and we try to figure out how things are going to come out if we do this or we do that. And the answer to that is we just can't possibly do that. There's no way you can figure out what's going to happen in the future unless you are specifically instructed by God. And so, uh, and so we go through these things, and, you know, some people would say, well, God doesn't cause any of these things to happen. He, he just allows them. Well, I beg to differ with that. I believe that God takes us into seasons of difficulty. God takes us into times... Uh, when, when we have pressure. And the reason is because he knows that our faith cannot grow without trouble. Now, it's true that sometimes that uh, our faith can grow during times that are pleasant, but for the most part, these kind of faith enlarging things, they come through seasons of trouble. And so when we are in one, it is really, really difficult to see ahead and see the future, but when God brings us all the way through it, and when we see the outcome that God was working on, and we see that our faith has become greatly enlarged through this, we are very grateful. It's not that we would want to do it again, but we're grateful for what we have seen happen in our lives. You know, and there's just nothing else besides going through it that I can say that would make you convinced of this. You have to go through the season and you have to have God enlarge your faith, really, in order for you to understand. But I promise you, and I know most of you have had things like that, so it's not like I'm trying to convince a bunch of beginners that that's true. But when you go through it, when your faith is enlarged, you like your Christian, Christianity, you like your Christian life better than you did before your faith was enlarged. And so, so this is something that's special. It's not just a little decision here or there. It's something that God orchestrates and brings us through so that we can get a good understanding. The second statement is when he's referred to their perseverance and faith in the midst of persecutions and afflictions. Uh, that's, that's coming from verse 4. Now, we know what perseverance is and we know what faith is. What I want to know is, do we know how to be perseverant? There was an occasion several years ago that we were up in Iowa uh, visiting some of Marla's relatives and, and uh, one of her uh, relatives, uh, his dad had a ski boat and, and we all went out skiing and, and I had never water skied before in my life. And so uh, Marla got up, she skied, a couple other people, and then I got up. And uh, it, what it seemed like at the time was that, um, that because I had never skied before, that the driver of the boat was trying to be really gentle with me. Uh, but what he was actually doing was he was pulling me out of the water and then he was slowing down. And I, not being experienced, I didn't know. And so I went down again and again and again and again. And nobody else wanted to ski until I finally got up. And, and so finally, uh, finally he 
shoved it in, and, and I got up and skied for a little while. But after that day, I had bruises, you know, like this big on my body. What I found out later was that, uh, that, that this man had a severe dislike of Baptist preachers because a lot of Baptist preachers speak against Masons, and he was a Mason. So I don't know if he was really doing that intentionally or not, but... Um, on our way back, we stopped to eat at this little chapel place, and uh, they said, if you decide you want to preach on perseverance, we'll listen. <laughs> so perseverance and faith, but in the midst of persecutions and afflictions. Now, yes, the Thessalonians were experiencing a lot of persecution, as was just about every single church in the first century, uh, not only from the rise of the persecution in Rome, but also at that time, the Jews were also very much into persecuting Christians. And so, uh, and so this perseverance and this faith was made very plain because it was in the middle of persecution. But he also, there, he says something else that brings us into the loop, and that is afflictions. You know, persecution and afflictions are not exactly the same thing. I suppose you could say all persecutions are afflictions, but not all afflictions are persecution. You know, afflictions can happen, that, that can be a, a sickness, a wasting disease, or it can be really, really difficult circumstances that come up. But the thing about uh, affliction is the nature of it is that it is a whole bunch at one time. The Greek word for affliction actually means to crowd, to crowd. And so what that word is saying is that we've got stuff coming at us from all directions. From all directions. Or perhaps we could say one thing after another, after another, after another. There's a passage in James that indicates that that's one of the ways that we know that Satan is behind it because he kind of works that way in the midst of afflictions. One thing after another. And so even though we're not necessarily experiencing persecution today, at the same time, we do often experience affliction. And that is just as a good a moment for your perseverance and faith to shine as any other time. All right, statement number three. This, in other words, number two, perseverance and faith, the midst of personal affliction, this is plain indication of God's righteous judgment. Okay, so let's circle the word righteous there. Uh, this, uh, this is in verse 5. Let's circle the word righteous because that's a key thing. If we took that word out, then we would totally misunderstand this passage. If we just said this is a plain indication of God's judgment, then the idea that we would get from that is that perse or that persecutions and afflictions is an example of God judging us, right? And furthermore, uh, if, we, uh, if we get down here uh, in verse 5, and it says, so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. If we took that word out, we would think that by reading that, that God is making us worthy for the kingdom by the persecutions and afflictions that we go through. See, that's not it at all. There's only one thing that makes us worthy of the kingdom of God, and that's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His shed blood, that makes us worthy. We don't suffer to become worthy of His name. We don't suffer to become worthy of His kingdom. And so that's why we need to make sure that we take note of that word, God's righteous judgment. Now, when he put that in there, that wasn't just a decorative word to make the sentence a little longer, to make it sound a little more poetic. Because judgment that God brings is always righteous. It's always righteous. And this is something like what I was referring to earlier about people that accuse God. Or people that, that say that God is not right, or God is not fair, or God is whatever. And, and sometimes we just truly, truly don't really understand what is really going on here. And so, uh, so what we can see is God's judgment or the decisions that God makes are always 
right ones. Now, let's think for just a minute about hell. I know you don't want to, but let's do just for a minute. And we're not going to go into graphic details here, but we know that, that it's real. We know that it is a place of extreme torment and suffering. We know that it lasts forever. And if you really dwell on the nature of the experience of hell, which we have no idea really what it amounts to, but we've got enough to know that it's really awful, and especially the part about it never ending, especially that, then, then we, we would think, God... Why would you do that? Why would you do that? You've probably heard people say that kind of thing before. How could a God of love cast somebody into hell? My answer to that was always, well, he died so that you'd have a way to escape it. But how could God do that? I mean, that just sounds so awful. Well, the answer to that question is that whether we can understand it or not, God's judgment is always right. It's righteous. And how could God allow His followers to go through the things that He's going through? Well, how, how, could, how could He allow people to be persecuted like this? I'm sure you probably remember this from 2015, that ISIS soldiers took approximately 30 Christians, Egyptian Christians, out onto the beach in Libya on the shore of the Mediterranean and beheaded them. And they videotaped the beheading and they put it on social media for the entire world to see. Now, here, here's the point that I think Paul is wanting to make. We, we see things like this going on, and we're not experiencing that kind of persecution. We will probably someday, uh, you know, see this kind of persecution, but right now we're not. Uh, but people on the other side of the globe are experiencing it all the time, just like these, these 30. You know, this was 2015. There's been, there were more people killed for the name of Jesus in the 20th century than the previous 19 combined. All right? And so... On the one hand, we say, how could God allow His people to do that? But then on the other hand, we, we look at this and we, what do we think that these murderers deserve? So what this scripture is saying is that these things that you are enduring and the way that God's enemies are treating Christians and the, the suffering and the persecution and the martyrdom, that is, is going to stand in the judgment day as evidence that God is right in bringing suffering and death to those who are His enemies. Furthermore, it is also an example of that God is worth all of our faith. And these people that, uh, that are killed for the name of Jesus Christ, they are a permanent, forever, eternal testimony that Jesus Christ is worthy to be followed, Jesus Christ is worthy to be praised. And I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if these executioners, when they are in hell, they lift up their eyes, that one of the things they just keep seeing for all of eternity is themselves beheading that Christian who is willing to die for the faith that he has in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be torment to have to go through that? Meanwhile, these, these martyred Christians are being dressed in fine white robes and, and they are rejoicing and, and, and all tears are wiped away from their eyes and, and they are just in complete absolute ecstasy really forever so no matter how harsh it seems to us that God would send his enemies or that he would prepare a place uh, for the devil and his angels and those who are his enemies to spend eternity in hell God's righteous in that he's not one bit unrighteous nor is he unrighteous to allow his people to experience persecution so, 
that is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment. Statement four. You know, there are a lot of things that I'm really looking forward to about the coming of Jesus. I'm looking forward to never sinning again. I'm looking forward to uh, not being diabetic anymore. I'm looking forward to uh, not having to get up in the morning and hobble for 15 minutes till my muscles all straighten out and I can finally stand up straight and walk. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, above all th other things, I'm looking forward to being in the presence of Jesus and actually seeing Him physically face to face. There's nothing that I can possibly think of that's going to be greater than that. Uh, to, that my faith becomes sight. But one of the things that we might not consider to be quite as spiritual as that, but it's just as much something that Paul indicates is that his coming is going to bring relief. Now I wonder how it would have happened if before those executioners beheaded those Christians, if just before they started, if suddenly the Son of God had appeared in the sky, and then those Christians would be looking up and, and suddenly their faces are bright and shining and they recognize Jesus is coming to rescue us. And the executioners at the same time are dropping their swords and their jaws are dropping open uh, because they know what's fixing to happen to them. They know exactly why that magnificent being is coming in the air. Because you see, when Jesus returns, it's going to bring relief. We see that in verse 7. Well, actually, let me read verse 6 again and then the, verse 7. If It is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. It is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. And... To give, you, to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So when, the, when Jesus returns, it's going to bring relief. Now it's interesting to me that this return is marked by the presence of his mighty angels and it's marked by flaming fire. Now, depending on which translation that you're looking at, uh, some of them, like the new AS that I'm using, it has in flaming fire in verse 7 and then other versions sometimes have in flaming fire in verse 8. And so, you think, well, that's kind of confusing. Well, just remember that Paul didn't write in verses. He just wrote, and it was somebody way later that divided everything up in, eight, in, in, in verses. But, but just for the sake of showing you what I'm trying to get at, if you put it in verse 8, it sounds like, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, meaning that the angels are in flaming fire. If you put it in verse 8, then it sounds like, in flaming fire, dealing out retribution. And so the retribution... But the reality is, it could be in either one of them, and there could be a comma after angels. And so, if you put it that way, it would be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution. Now, that, folks, is not a secret rapture. It's not. This idea that, that Jesus is going to come and all the Christians are going to disappear and, and then everybody's going to wake up the next morning and suddenly some of these people are gone. The Bible really never describes that. It says, when he is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution. Now I could go into a lot of other verses here in 2 Thessalonians, some of which we looked at last week, to prove this. Uh, but let me just say this way. Paul believed that the return of Jesus to bring relief to his suffering saints and the time when Jesus begins to deal retribution to his enemies are one and the same. They're one and the same. And I say begins to deal retribution. That does not mean that it's all going to happen on that one day, but that's the day when it's going to begin. 
in Revelation when uh, at, the, at the sound of the last trumpet it mentions uh, that he begins to destroy those who destroy the earth. So you see that, that regardless of where you want to put it time-wise, and I know some of you may not agree with where I put it time-wise, uh, but, but regardless of where it is, this is not a, a secret thing. This is a thing where Jesus appears and it's obvious this is what is going on. This is what's happening. Okay. You don't have to be experiencing persecution to get relief, do you? Sometimes the relief that we might experience might be relief from affliction. You know, I, I, like I said earlier, I'm looking forward to getting relief from the ailments that this aging body is starting to, to experience. How many of you are looking forward to the day, let's just say that the rapture were to come tomorrow, how many of you would be happy that you don't have to go to work the next day? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought, right. So, you know, it's going to be a time of relief, even though we might not be experiencing persecution at the time, but there's gonna, it's going to be a relief in that sense of the word. And the same as say, well, if I don't die first. Well, yeah, that's true. But, you know, there are some ways in which death is also a relief. In that sense, that they, the return of Jesus and death are alike. You know, how many times have you talked about someone who's passed on and you've said, well, at least they're not suffering anymore. So there's relief. But that relief, I don't think, is totally complete until the resurrection. Because, you know, the, the people who have passed on, they don't have their per permanent forever body yet. That's not going to happen until the return of Jesus and, and the, the resurrection. Somebody say, well, what about, the, what about in heaven now? Do they have bodies in heaven? The answer to that question, I can clearly and definitively say, I don't know. And I've not been able to find anything really in the scriptures that I thought even if I could interpret it a certain way, I, I really don't know uh, whether they have a body now or if they are sp just you know spiritually in Jesus Christ. I, I do believe that they are conscience, uh, that they are self-aware, they are rejoicing in heaven. Uh, but you know, just because your favorite football player passed away and went to heaven doesn't mean that he's quarterbacking in heaven right now. I don't know if they can see us or not. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, so, uh, our dear departed one is looking down and smiling right now. I don't know if they can see us or not. There's not really a, an indication in the scripture. If they do have a body, it's, it's a temporary sort. So, we're not going to try to pin that down, but I am bringing all this out to say that even for those who have found the relief of death, that the day of the resurrection is still going to be the culmination of the relief that they experience from this life. Because that's when we get the new, perfect, glorified body to live forever in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, we've talked about uh, the enlargement of our faith. And we've talked about perseverance and faith in the midst of persecutions and afflictions. We've talked about God's righteous judgment. We've talked about the day is going to give us relief. The fifth statement is that Jesus will be revealed. And we've kind of talked about that already. Uh, but Jesus is going to be revealed. It's going to be an amazing thing. All of the fondest wishes, or at least what they say they wish, of the atheists are going to be fulfilled in that day. If Jesus would just come down and reveal himself, well, then I'd say, well, I guess I was wrong. Or if Jesus would just reveal himself, everybody would believe in him. I'm, I'm really not sure I think that way. I don't know that they would even if they saw him. But on that day, yeah, the atheists are going to say, oh, boy, did I mess up. Problem is, it's too late. It's going to be too late for them. And then finally, the sixth statement, glorified in his saints. There's a, 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 an old Christian song that I used to like a lot, and it said, uh, Darwin's going to wonder if something's amiss when he tries to figure out how I evolved to this. <laughs> 
And the scriptures are pretty plain that, that when we are glorified, that we will bring glory to him. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that when the angels see firsthand what God has made us to be, that they're going to bring praise to the glory of the grace of God because they, they see us like we are now. They see, what, they see what we do in the closet. They see things that you might not really want them to see. And they see our frailty. And they're going to look at us in that day and they're going to say, Wow, God took that and turned him, in, turned him into this? Wow, God, you really are amazing that you could do something like that. That's how, that's how great a difference it's going to be. And so, though we will be glorified, the true glory or the, the praise and the honor and the recognition is going to go to Jesus because His greatness, His grace, His fullness, His power is the thing that is going to come through our glorified lives. You know, the... In Hebrews, it talks about how that the builder of the house gets more glory than the house itself. And, you know, you can you know for yourself if you see a, a great-looking building, a house, uh, and then you find out, you know, so-and-so built that. Wow, especially if you know the builder. You know, oh, wow, that's, that's really amazing. The builder of the house gets more glory than the house. Well, we're going to be like the house. He's the builder. So he's glorified in his saints. I want you now just to kind of close your eyes for a minute. I want you just to imagine that day. I know that some of you younger people have things that you want to do first before he comes, things that you want to experience in this life. But I can promise you that when it does happen, we're, gonna, we're definitely going to be ready. And it's going to be great. And all of the things that seem like fairy tales to so many people, they're, they're true. They're literally true. Jesus appearing in the air with the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ rising first and then all of us being caught up together to meet them in the air. It's all true. It's all literally true. It's going to happen. Do you believe this? If so, then we can take great hope, great encouragement, great comfort in this. Now, while you're imagining, I also want you to look back in history. I want you to look back to Jesus as he's hanging on the cross, paying the price so that this event can happen. Paying the price for my sins and for your sins. Because you see, without the death, then our glorification could never have occurred. We wouldn't get new, glorified, amazing bodies and have amazing experiences with Jesus if he had not died on the cross and, and suffered greatly one of the most severe forms of execution that's ever been invented. He suffered that so that we could have that hope. So as we're envisioning forward, and back. Let's just give our praise and thanks and glory to Jesus. And if we're really thinking about it right, then I believe that that will give us the motivation that we need to, to trust Him and to obey Him in this life. You know, love is not exactly the same thing as obedience. But love will almost always, well, love always, no almost to it, love will always prompt us to obey him. So you can talk about how much love of Jesus that you want to, but if you're not really obeying him, then what that says is that your love is not nearly as great as what you think it is. But that motivation to worship and to serve and to prepare and to be ready and to, and to, Try to take others with us. 
should be all the motivation that we ever need. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have established the truth of your return. I thank you that you have made...